Yeah, but uh, <coughs> wonderful and written song. And I appreciate it. I saw the heart in it. You feel a spirit in it. You ever listen to the words, you're in the spirit. Really connected. So I pray you out there. Listen, thank y'all for letting me come again. I don't know how many times I've got to be a part of Revival Calico, but I thank you very much. And uh, I always have enjoyed coming. And I appreciate you uh, giving some grace here for me. And uh, these uh, having to miss tomorrow night. But uh, you'll continue to be in our prayers, and uh, we appreciate your prayers tonight for Debbie, and then also continue to pray for her as we uh, go forward in this. And uh, we're trusting the Lord. Uh, I'm thankful that, uh, you know, the Lord, uh, as I mentioned last night, I said you, you're going to have to go through some things, you know. Uh, but I, you'll have 15 good years, and I still believe that with all my heart. And uh, just didn't know it's going to come as quick as tomorrow. So, uh, but we're here, and, uh, and so praise God for that. I'm going to give you two messages in one tonight. I'm not going to preach doubly long, <laughs> so uh, uh, don't panic. Second Chronicles chapter seven, and I felt like the Lord was leading me here to the uh, entire uh, meeting, and so uh, I, I was pretty certain of where we were headed tonight, tomorrow night. So I'm just going to sort of. I uh, give you the, the basics of both nights and what it would be, and uh, I give you some thoughts to leave here on as a uh, so hopefully I'll help you and you'll walk with the Lord. Okay, again, second cause we've been likening this to uh, God moving uh, as He did with the children of Israel, and how I believe that uh, He is now moving in our land. We have uh, uh, it's not in the way we seem to think it ought to come. You know, we, we think about revival a lot of times uh, uh, being this euphoric experience to which uh, has fire, excitement, and all of these things with it. And, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I can tell you that seems to be a lasting euphoria. That seems to be what I think most folks think of revival, whether it comes through song, through preaching, whatever it might come. But uh, this revival is going to come through pain. It's going to come through pain. And... Uh, uh, I believe it's going to be the greatest revival America has ever seen, and maybe even uh, close to Pentecost in the world. I believe it's going to be an end time thing that God is bringing. He's going to bring it to pain. It's going to be great difficulty in the natural realm, but it's going to be wonderful in the spiritual realm. You know, we read the Bible and see healing on every page. Why isn't it so today? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing changed with God, nothing's changed with His people. Little pain can get us back to where we recognize we're his people above all things, above everything in life. He, we, he is our king, he's our Lord, we've been redeemed as it's been sung about, we're his children, and we to be living for an eternal kingdom. And when he comes and snatches all the temple away, then we have a better opportunity to focus on the eternal. He's going to help us because we don't seem to be able to do it on our own. We can't seem to get in time out of the entanglements we're in. We, 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 we owe the bank and we owe the auto dealer and we owe this one and, the, and we got to eat and we got all this stuff and we're just entangled in it and we don't seem to know how to just get out. Yeah. And he's going to come help us. And so tonight we, we've been looking at that this week and we go a little further with it. Stand with me if you will. We begin in verse 12. Again, 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 7, verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night. He said unto him, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place, the temple to myself, for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, bring a drought. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, I bring a famine. Or if I send pestilence among my people, disease. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then when I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to hear it, so our heart can be healed. Lord, you, we talked about your uh, land representing our hearts, so Lord, help us to see if we'll humble, pray, seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, you'll hear us. And you'll forgive us, and you'll heal our heart. Help us to see it, O oh God. Father, may every hindrance, every lie, every deception be bound in the name of Jesus. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. 
last night we talked about uh, the first two parts of this conditional promise that we need to humble and we need to pray. I won't reiterate much, but to say humility is the door by which you uh, connect with God. It's how you stay connected with God. How you're going to walk with God. You're going to get miracles through humility. You're not going to get uh, miracles uh, coming in your life through proud, arrogant boastfulness. Uh, Danny hates if I ever tell this story at one part of the night's message, which is going to be now again. Uh, when I got saved, uh, uh, I, this is a terrible thing to start off. This is I, I believe it's what told us here won't be saved, so I'm going to tell you. Right before I got saved, I had a place on my tailbone. It was about that big, or half a dollar size. And it would not go away. And I was one of these arrogant rascals that would not go to the doctor. I didn't go to the doctor, you know. And when I got out of Dad's house, I didn't go to the doctor. I didn't go to the dentist and all that. And let me tell you, you end up paying for some of that stuff later, especially the dentist. But anyhow, uh, go to the dentist, young people. Go to the dentist. Just go if you take, take you go, do whatever it is. But I, I, I wouldn't go. I was a dog, but I wouldn't go to the doctor for this thing. Well, it was so bad that it would it would uh, rupture at times, and it, when it would do, it would ruin my bridges. Okay, and Debbie would get all mad at me about the thing. She'd say, "You gotta quit. You gotta go to the doctor. You're running too many pair of pants." And so eventually, I had to wear uh, you know, uh, shorts with my underwear, shorts, shorts, you know, like gym shorts, and, and all because and then it just ruined them. And then she she's going, "Why don't you go to the doctor? You're so stubborn." Well, that was when I was lost. When I got saved. Oh, man, I done been seeing some of them healing guys on TV. I said, oh, oh you a healer, God. You're going to heal me. And so for the next three, four years, now I went around there, now Bible college and all, all the way through Bible college, with pads on the back of my bridges and everything because God was going to heal me of this thing. It's grown now. It's you. And so I'm sitting there going, we get long toward Christmas when we'd go back down to where my, my, most of the family were in Georgia. And I told Debbie, I said, Tell you what I want you to do. And she's a nurse. I said, Debbie, bring home some Novocaine and a couple of scalpel. And I'm going to get over to bed and you can shoot me up and cut that thing out. And so, <laughs> you think you got to go to the doctor when you were in there. So she did. She brought home all these scalpels, you know, and, I, and, and a bunch of overcame syringes. And I laid out over the bed, and she shot me up, went to digging with them scalpels, trying to get that thing to the core of that eye. And after a while, I could feel the pressure, but it wasn't hurting a lick, you know. She just pressing around there, and, you know. And finally, she said, Kenny, it's just way too deep. I ain't ever going to be able to get to that. And, and it's no game won't go far enough down for that. I said, I ain't bought enough on me anyhow, and it's too deep. You just gonna have to go to the doctor. And she bandaged me up the best she could. And so the end of it. Well, I had, a, like I said, I had about two more months before we was going back down to the home. And so I, I said, well, that ain't work. So uh, I said, you know, Lord, I've been believing you to heal me and, and, and all, and you ain't doing that. So I, I called my father. I said, how about making me an appointment with your dermatologist? Well, my father didn't tell me, but he told me he would, but he got off and started praying. And he never did call the dermatologist. But about two weeks before we was together, I was in my prayer closet. At the time, I was praying in the closet. Now, I don't believe that really means you have to pray in the closet, but I happened to be in the closet. That was my prayer time where it was. I had everything tore out of it and just prayed that. But you do need a place that you go to pray. Yeah, I'll be a place if you've you got a permanent home. You ought to have a place you're fond to go to that cuts out the world so you can get to leave that phone out in another room, cut it off so you don't hear it go bzz, bzz, bzz. Don't let it put it on vibrator or silent. You'll hear it, then you'll want to quit and go out there. That's right. There's that now. Cut it off. Put it under six pillows or something. But just get it off. <laughs> and get along somewhere and talk to God. But anyhow, it's in my prayer closet. I was talking to God about everything but my backside. Right on the tailbone. I tell you, just, and I was just talking to God, and all of a sudden God said, where's your place? Buddy, that had been with me about eight years. I reached my hand around there on my tailbone, that thing was as slick as a baby's body. That thing was gone. Amen. And I got to weeping, and I said, Lord, what is it? And this is what the Lord said. You will not tell me to heal you. All I heard is you tell.
tell him that to heal you. You won't tell me to heal you. I do the healing. What that means, you arrogant rascal? <laughs> I'm the one that's doing the healing. It ain't your faith, it's how good I am that's doing the healing. Anything we're going to get through God comes through humility. It'll never come through arrogance and pride. So, in any point in time and place in our life, whether it's a COVID-19 or difficulty in your own personal life or wherever it, it is, you always <coughs> want to be approaching God with humility. It's what He responds to. Then we talked about prayer last night. Prayer is the absolute most important activity of Christian's life. Nothing more important than prayer. Everything you're going to do with God is going to be through prayer. Whether it's getting saved through prayer, sanctified through prayer, healed through prayer. Praise is actual prayer. The song the Pope wrote was a prayer. It was all him. It was to him. Real praise is to him. Thanksgiving is... To him, it's types of praying that we're doing, okay? And so prayer is the means by which uh, communication is made to God, all right? And, and we, we reach God. So again, when trouble comes and difficulty comes and COVID-19 and this next wave comes, for God to respond in my life, he's going to do it through humility, through prayer. And the third thing he said here is seek my faith. And that's interesting because he says specifically his face. He's talking about a time when he's going to bring drought, a famine, and sickness and disease, pestilence into his people. All this stuff. And he says, if you're humble, pray, watch this, and seek my face. Notice what he doesn't say, seek my hand. Come on. See, when you're in trouble, pain, and difficulty, and the drought's coming, or the famine's coming, or, or, or somehow or another, here comes this disease, we go to seeking God, but what it is is we want God to come and fix the famine, or, or, or the drought, or fix the disease, and that's really His hand. God, fix me, touch me, heal me, help me. What He can do. He says, when these things come, what you need to do is humble, pray, watch this, and seek my face. What does that mean? Well, face, there's Blake. How do I know? It's his face. It makes me know that's Blake over there. Retorts or face. Look at it. How do I know? It, it, it's your personhood. That's how I know who you are. It's who you are. He says, if my people which are called on my name shall humble themselves, pray, watch this, and seek me. Not what I can do, but seek me. That means seek my presence. When's the last time you really went to God with no list, no ulterior motive, maybe even thinking, I, if I thank you and praise you enough, you'll know and fix whatever it is I want you to do. When's the last time you really went to God with the idea that all you really want to do is know Him and get closer to Him? You want, to, you want to get to know Him and, and, and know Him more intimately and know Him uh, more fully and, 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 and get closer to Him than ever before and nothing else being your motive. Yeah. Let me tell you something about that right there. His presence, you know, I, 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 <laughs> this is funny because if you ask people, one of my pet peeves is, is you know, people say, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, I, I, I did this for years. I heard a preacher one time say, you know, talking about God inhabits the praises of his people. And, and, and you should never hear other preachers and pick up what they say. You shouldn't do it. But as a young preacher, you ain't got nothing to preach, so you're picking up whatever other preacher said, you know, kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, so you just, you, you, you do it. So I did it back then, and, and it took about five years for God to fix me. But anyhow, this is what he said. I, you know, it says in the Psalms, he inhabits the praise of his people. And this preacher I heard say, what that means is, is when you praise God, you summons him from the throne. I said, man, that sounds good. <laughs> and so, boy, when I was preaching about that, that ever come up, I said, you know what that means? That means you summons him from the throne. And I said that for a few years, every time that come up, I'd say it. And one morning after saying that in my prayer closet, the Lord whispered to me, I wish you'd quit saying that. And I said, what was 
song of David, he says, son, I don't come from anywhere. I'm already there. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, well, what, would, what does it mean you inhabit the praises of your people? He said, that means I made you and let you know I'm there. You begin to experience my presence when you praise me. Amen. See, it's one thing to recognize by knowledge and the reality that God is everywhere. His presence is everywhere. He's omnipresent. Amen. He is never missing. The eyes of the Lord, uh, listen, it says, over all the earth, seeing both the evil and the good. Do you ever think about how much evil God witnesses? The things behind the scenes that we don't even want to talk about, shudder to think about. He never misses seeing it all. You ever think about in that terms what the restraint of God must be? There are things that it would just be impossible maybe, to be restrained. If I had the power and the ability to stop them, I mentioned the other night somewhere talking about uh, the, 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 uh, the police officer that was on the throat of that black man in that, uh, down in that street. And if I had a camera over there, he wouldn't have been doing that without having to lock me up. Okay, that's the way that had been. I'd have had zero restraint. But God didn't stop it. And many things all across the globe. He doesn't step in and stop. Why is that? Why doesn't God stop a child abuser and all these things that go on that are evil all over the world? It's better you know the answer. It's for this one simple reason. And it's, 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 it's the whole means by which he made it all. It's God wants to be in relationship with mankind. He's given mankind this incredible thing called free to live. The way you want to live your life. And he will not take it from you. He has given you. You were made in the image of God. You were made in the image of God. God is free and He gave you the freedom. He chose to allow you and to allow me in His sovereignty. He says, okay, I'm going to give you the ability and, and the capability of choosing how you're going to live and I won't take it away from you. I'll come and call you. I'll, I'll send people in your life. I'll have I'll do my, I'll come and I'll wait and I'll send my spirit to woo you and draw you and all these things. But I'm not going to make you. Why? Because I don't want to, I'm giving you that freedom, that autonomy to live the way that you choose to live. And God so longed for us to choose Him <laughs> and to walk with Him. So he says, when trouble, pain comes, humble prayer, seek me. Not what I can do, not to fix him of the problem. It's there to make us seek him. That's why I ask you, what's happened to you spiritually since COVID-19 come, has come on the scene? Are you closer to Jesus? Have you learned to know more about him? I cannot know more about Jesus or <coughs> seek the Lord and seek His face doing something temporal. I have to do something spiritual. Now I can go help somebody and, 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 but I'm doing it intentionally spiritually for the spiritual motive. Are you following what I'm saying? I'm not go help somebody and go down there but my motive is a spiritual motive for King Jesus. I may do something in the natural realm but the purpose for doing it is a spiritual reason, even though it might be in the natural realm. But if I'm going to get close to Jesus and seek His face and to really know Him, I'm going to have to be intimate with Him. And that's going to take an act of faith. Because He's not, you're not going to see Him, you're not going to touch Him, you're not going to feel Him. You're going to have to do something of faith, pray the Word. You're going to have to praise. You're going to have to do some things of faith to get closer. You're going to have to, watch this, to seek His face. Seek. Everybody say seek. Seek. That means it'll take a while. The very word by definition means it's a quest, it's a hunger, it's a thirst. Seek. We want it. 
Click the button, click the button, click that stinking button. <laughs> if I can't click the button, done with it, you know. What is this? Don't worry about it. You know. And, and what happens to us, well, I, now, don't get me wrong. I, I do a little texting. I do. But me and texting, I don't think texting is helping us communicate. It helps us pass information, but it doesn't help us communicate. In fact, if you get a text from me, it's because I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I got time, I just got to text me to get the information. Me and Blake text once a week, don't we, Blake? We, yeah. we're, we're setting up our meetings, see? And so the idea, we're just passing the information. We ain't chatting, you know, kind of thing. But a lot of people, that's, you know, they do. Uh, I have a friend who's deaf, and I don't sign, and so he wanted to meet with me, and, and we met and sat and texted right across one from another. I thought that was pretty neat. The restaurant takes him back and forth, you know, that way they thought we were nuts. But anyhow, you know. <laughs> but communication with God, seeking God, is a, an act of faith. So he says, when this trouble, this pain comes, and this next wave comes, humble, pray, seek me. Not what I do, not fixing the thing, the problem, seek me. It's, 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 it's amazing how freeing that is. He, watch this right here. He says this. The Lord says, I'll meet all your needs. I know everything that you need before you even ask. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. These are all his promises. Now watch. And what he's longing to see his children do is to be able to not ask him for all this stuff and just believe he's already promised to get it and begin to seek him, all right, and for who he is. You know, we all get focused in our pain. Every one of us. This preacher right here with the pain and the discomforts of life and things and problems and hurts and all. And, and, and I can tell you, you can get focused on those things because they hurt. And God knows that they hurt. They, he knows that we're hurting in those situations. I've had them. I know what it's like, okay? But when I can drive my focus to God, then I begins to fall. And healing begins to fall. When I take my focus off the pain and the hurt and begin it, begin it on the one that can help and heal. And watch this. Not for the purpose of that. To be free from the hurt. But just to know you. Yes. Just to know you. Sometimes I have to do stuff like this. Sometimes I just have to say, Lord, I'm hurt. I mean, remember, I'm talking honest, so I don't want to be over here hurting and faking some words out while I'm over here really wanting to whine about this. It's hurting. Okay? So I just tell him, I'm intentionally, deliberately doing this. I believe this is what you want, and I want to know you deeper. This is killing me, but I want to know you better. And I keep making these pronouncements and somehow or another, I leave. Somehow this gets left behind. And you get over here and you And you to know him deeper and more intimately than before. What you're doing there is you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he begins to add all this up to you. So the struggles come. And more is on the way. Should humble, pray, seek his face, and he says, turn from your wicked ways. Well, okay, we understand the world and wicked ways. How about the church? Does the church have wicked ways? Yeah, they do, but not this way. Okay, this is not the kind of wicked ways that the church has. This is the kind of wicked ways the lost people have, but not people in the church. This gets confusing sometimes to folks. In order to be a Christian, okay, and if you are a Christian, you're not going to willfully, habitually continue in the same sin and keep going that way. You're not going to do that. You're not going to willfully, intentionally, deliberately continue to sin against God. 
You may mess up a heap. You may have struggles that you have through with addictions and other things that you're trying to get over and over that. But every time you do it, you come back and say, God, I'm sorry about that. Oh, help me, Lord. And you keep fighting and you try to do better. And you fight. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about willfully, intentionally, deliberately say, bless God. I'm going to keep in this adulterous affair no matter what. It's enjoyable to me. And I'm still, bless God, saved. No, you ain't. That's right. Go ahead, you're lost. That's right. The Bible says a man can't do that. Because God's seed remains in him, 1 John. He can't continue, habitually continue to sin, knowing he's sinning and going to do it no matter what. The Bible says God's seed remains in a child of God. He's going to do that. He might mess up and fall and have to repent and that kind of thing, no doubt. But he's not going to willfully, intensely, habitually sin. But God's people do have some wicked ways. How did I show it? Uh, years ago, Debbie and I went into a uh, restaurant down in Charlotte. It was about 100 degrees, middle of the summer, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, sun, bright, bright, bright sun. Not a cloud in the sky. And the foyer to the entrance to the restaurant these people told us to go to was glass. So when we walked in there, there's a foyer about near the wall, and we had to walk through that, that bright sun. So you can imagine that glass hot. And we go up the double doors, no window. We open the door. And we go in, I could tell it was dark, and that door shut behind us, I couldn't see a thumb. And I said, Debbie, can you see anything? She said, I don't see nothing. I said, me either. Where's the door handle? Let's get out of here. And, and, and finally, a little voice says, it's okay. It's a waitress. And I said, I bet you, we can't even see you. You know what I'm saying? So she got a little closer and realized that, uh, you know, and she said, come on, we got a table down there. I said, don't walk fast, you know, I can't get there, you know, but eventually she leads us down here to this table, gave us menus. I don't know what he's going to do with these menus, I can't even see her, but anyhow, after sitting there a few minutes, I looked around there, I could see everything. I told Debbie somebody cut her on a lot, but ain't nobody cut her on a lot, what happened? My eyes adjusted to the darkness. Here's the strange thing, I was calling that light. And I can tell you in America as Christians, we're faced with darkness everywhere. So let me tell you what's happened to us. We've got so adjusted to it, some of that stuff we're now calling light. You know what that is? If something is actually, so the folks are going to close the verse here in a minute. This, this thing, if you think something is right, but it's actually wrong, how are you ever going to get out of it? Jesus said, if that darkness in you, you think it's light, how great is that darkness? Because you think it's light, so how in the world are you ever going to change? If you think something's right, and it's actually wrong, you're deceived. And then how are you going to get out of it? You can't get out of it. Why would you get out of it? Because you don't think it's wrong. You see what I'm saying? So you would never get out of it. That's called deception. And, and, and I can tell you, you can never, ever get out of deception on your own. You have to have help. You have to have some, somebody to help you. So let me ask you a question. How do you know if something in your life you may think, you may think, Everything's all right. But what if something was wrong? And you actually thought it was right. Wouldn't that be miserable to be sitting here thinking everything's all right in your life, but God actually has some problems with something in your life? Every day I get up and I can promise you when I go to bed, I don't think there's nothing between me and God. That's been that way for about 24 years. But, uh, I've been saying longer than that, but I didn't really get full of this light until sometime after, about a year and a half after. But it was this, that every day of my life, I go before God and make sure that there's nothing between me and Him. And I don't try to go through my life to remember yesterday, did I do this, did I do this, all that kind of stuff. I don't do that. You know why I don't do that? Because I'll justify myself in anything I do. If I thought about something I said to Debbie, I promise you, if you give me two minutes, I'll tell you how it's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. And, uh, and most of you that are married, or, it won't be long, you'll figure out how they did. Be too drunk down there. Watch Nancy, she'll have you wrong at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying. And it's easy for that kind of thing to happen in your life. 
So watch this. You don't go judging yourself and trying to figure out if everything's all right. Paul says, I don't judge myself. Why? Because we end up overlooking stuff. We don't have perfect understanding, perfect knowledge. We don't have all of that. And besides all of that, we sort of like ourselves. So I go to God and I say, Lord, is there anything between us? Anything between me and somebody else? Because if there's anything between me and somebody else, there's something between me and you. Lord, is there something I need to correct in somebody's life? Is there something I've done that I need to address? Because I don't want nothing between me and you, Lord. Is anything slipped up? And listen, that's hardly a morning. He doesn't show me some. I've been saved, sanctified, sold out for Jesus for I don't know how long now. And I can tell you it's hardly a morning when I get to praying that that he ain't saying something about something that I've done. Some of y'all a whole lot better than me. See, I can tell the way y'all look at y'all. Y'all don't get much of that. But I, I get corrected all the time. I, I promise you, I have something said to me about what's going on in my life. But let me tell you what happens when I don't hear nothing. Do you know what happens? Man, joy rolls over. It rolls over me. And if it, now watch this. And you say, well, wait a minute. Maybe there's something wrong. Well, that's on him, man. Are y'all with me? It's on him because I've already cried out to him and said, and he knows I'm crying out. I'm ready to hear it. I'll do it. What is it? And I don't get nothing. He knows I didn't get nothing, so it's on him for him I didn't get nothing. And what happens is, is that makes assurance in my heart that I'm right with him and walking with him. And what joy that brings in my heart. Even after he'll correct something and he knows I'm going to fix it. I might not leave the prayer closet right then, but I'm going to fix it. Most of the time it's with Debbie or the kids or grandkids or something. Or maybe it's a Walmart clerk out there. But anyhow, you get down. <laughs> a lot of times it's preachers or congregations. Sometimes I'll just Well, the whole congregation of people sometimes, you know. You, you, you can get that way every once in a while. And Paul would say this. Sometimes the anointing God gives you for something, you use it the wrong way. Paul said, lest I come over there and absolutely destroy you. And God humbled me before you because I just, just eat you up for the sin you got there. He was saying, i got to watch myself, but I don't do that. And so sometimes he said, Boy, you didn't prepare right yesterday. You didn't let me... I know I've told y'all this before. I used to have these polished up sermons. I mean, I had some doozies. I had them good, ironed out. I, I mean, down to commas. When I'd stop, when I'd move this way, I mean, I had them down. And I promise you, every time I preach them, you'd cry at the same spot. You'd holler at the same spot. I'd stop and wait on you to holler because I knew you was going to holler. I mean, it just was that way. It's the way I had them ironed out. And I preached them things for about five or six years. And seven, eight years, I was going around there. I think about seven. I was going around and preaching these things. And people was going, oh, man, it's great sermons all this. One night after preaching one of them things, and people was going, whoo, 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 whoo. God said, I'd like to talk to the people, but I can't get a word in for all those sermons. You're too busy preaching sermons, and I can't talk to the people. I'd really like to talk to the people every night, but you've got to say all them words you're saying. I got to preach in them sermons anymore. I come over here and try to let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Amen. Say something to you about where you are, His love for you, what's going on in life. So, how do I get on that? Oh, yeah. So, every day, crying out, sometimes He tells me, say, You just had to say that. You had to get funny. You try to be cute. Sometimes He'll get me for that. You just you got them laughing and you just like yourself. You just get them laughing. We missed an opportunity to speak. Listen, there's sometimes to laugh. I'll even tell God, I say, sometimes I'm killing them people a little bit. Can't we have something funny happen? I mean, it looks like they do better. And you know, and Lord will give me something. That once was sort of funny, you know, it helps people, you know, be able to hear. But the whole point is this. He corrects them. And he keeps us from deception. How do I get out of it? I've got to have help. So watch this. If you're humble, pray, seek his face, in that light, he'll bring healing to everything in your life. Yes, sir. 
And if you'll do what he says, he gives you heart. Troubles come, troubles coming. Humble pray, seek him, do what he says, he'll bring healing. Sermon number two, it ain't going to be quite as long. Right after uh, COVID came, I went down to a, a lake uh, not far from your Bay Lake. And uh, I had spent the previous day nine hours on the phone, literally, with either a call waiting or had to call one back, nine straight hours. They were all from preachers, uh, district superintendents, bishops, all kinds of people in the churches and denominations I preached in over the southeast were calling, asking me what I thought about this code and what we all do. And so I was talking to one, hang on one, or call waiting, you know, just hit over and go back to that guy, tell him waiting, and hang on. I sit there for several of those hours with that stinking little cord with my phone plugged in, you know, you just clamped <laughs> into a corner anyhow. But anyhow, during the course of that, this is basically what was happening. Half of those preachers were over here saying, we need to obey that government. The Bible says we ought to obey the leaders of our land. The leaders of our land are telling us that we ought to shut down for a while. They're not telling us not to uh, preach Jesus or anything. It's all about trying safety and people not being uh, sick. And so I think we ought to shut down. The other half over here was going, bless God, we ought to be the church, we ought to meet God's a healer, he's going to keep us, he loves us, if that's the way I'm going to die, bless God, I'll just go that way. Now, I'll be honest, I was sitting there going, well, this bunch was saying, you know, we got to obey the government and all that, and I'm saying, yeah, the Bible says all that, and I tell them, yeah, the Bible says we ought to obey the government, and I, yeah, you're right, they're not telling us not to preach Jesus, and this bunch over here, well, we ought to be church, we ought to meet together, we ought to have faith, I'm going, yeah, we ought to have faith, yeah, we need to meet together, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm sitting there thinking about something, there's something, there's something better than this, you know. But they, I, I just sit there listening to them, talk to them. But it was driving me nuts, okay? And so when it was, I had to preach that night, so as soon as I got up all the calls, I went and preached, beat, tuckered out, got up early, 3.30, 4 o'clock, down Baden Lake down there. I rebuked every devil in North Carolina. They were like, there wasn't any on the eastern seaboard when I got through rebuking that devil. And when I finished that, I started talking to God and I said this to the Lord. I said, Lord, I have got to hear from you. I said, I got these men calling me, talking to me about all this, what we all do. And I want to hear what you say. Now, a lot of times it takes me a while to hear from God. I'm just being honest with you because most of the time, this will help you. Let this help you right here. If you're wanting to hear from God, here's what you've got to do first. If you try to hear from God, Get God to speak into your life before you do what I'm telling you. You're going to miss it. And it's going to be hard for you to ever hear. So pay close attention, all right? The first thing you do if you're going to hear from God about anything is you've got to get you and your preference out of the way. Come on. As long as you have a preference about the issue, you want it to turn out one way. It's always going to blind you to whether or not you've heard from God or not. All right? So what I usually have to start doing is getting rid of my preference on the matter. And sometimes, depending on how much my affection's on it or how much I would really like for it or I think it might ought to be, it may take me longer to get, get that settled out to where I can get to a place where I can get God. Not this morning. <laughs> I mean, all I was concerned about was telling these guys what God wanted and he knew that was it. And so when I said, God, I've got to hear from you, he went to speak. Here's the first thing he said. I don't need another Sunday morning ritual. Here's one bunch worried about getting into church. You know, we got to get over there. You know, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. This bunch, we got to get over there, we got to get over there. And God was more concerned about how we were coming, whether or not we come or not. We turn these things into just sort of shrines and uh, exercises of coming in the door and going out the door and coming in the door and going out the door. And there's no heart. There's no passion. There's no real thrill of coming. Watch this. Now listen carefully. To worship together. This isn't really a worship service. You don't need this for a worship service. 
How many of you know this really isn't the house of God? Amen. This is the house <laughs> that God's people meet in. But you and I are the temple of God. We're the house of God. God dwells in me. So I should worship all the time. Everywhere. I should work a bit my job or at the yard or wherever I'm doing the car or whatever I'm doing. He's there and I should worship him. Coming to the meeting house is to worship him together. Yeah. We're forgetting the together part. We come in here as a bunch of individuals or individual families and we sort of park our little fannies down where our little group sits and we just sort of do our thing right there in our little corner and grin at everybody. But it isn't really a bunch of getting together, coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ, happy to see each other like you do at your family gatherings and everybody's hugging, tossing chicken, slapping, oh, hey, brother, woo -hoo, everybody together, oh, out here. Right here. Right here. You over there, I'm over there. <laughs> <laughs> You know how it is. <laughs> and God's looking down at all that going, I didn't think you know, kind of thing. Yeah, we worship God every day. We, he dwells within us. And so we're walking in communion and we're worshiping in there. We get to come together with one another here. Mm -hmm. God told Israel, Isaiah 1, you read it, that's your homework. Isaiah 1, he had told them through the Old Testament how to make these sacrifices, how to do them, what days to do them, all kinds of feasts and everything to do. And by the time, that's all back up there with Moses and the Pentateuch coming along, the first five books of the Bible, and they were to do these every day, what day they were doing, all this kind of stuff. By the time he gets to Isaiah, let me hear what he says. He says, away with it. I'm sick of it. In fact, he says, I hate it. It's a stench to me. The very things he told them that they needed to do, that he were doing it in such without any heart, and it had become just a total check-the-box kind of thing that it finally made God sick of his stomach. He said, wait, that's the feeling and the thought that came over me when he said, I don't need another Sunday morning ritual. Second thing he told me was, well, the second thing actually he told me was someone was saying it was faith, the coronavirus was faith. And the second thing the Lord told me was this. Have you heard your president say anything about fake news concerning the coronavirus? I said, no, I ain't heard him say fake news about the coronavirus. That was the second thing he said. But he went on to say this. He said, my people are living way too fast. Their minds are going way too fast. I want them to slow down. When you think about in your mind how stimulated it is continually. Man, it's just constant on stimulation. This, 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 this. Whether it's TV, whether it's the phone, whether it's the internet, whether it's whatever. And we're adding all the stuff, Twitter, Snapchat, and all that. Oh, please, Jesus, deliver me from it all. I, I didn't think I'd ever, uh, what did I call it, what, text? I didn't think I'd ever text. But I did. Now, look, I, I can actually type a little bit with one finger. I know what's happening to me. Corrupting in front of me, but I'm just saying, I don't want to add anything else. And, and, and the idea is, we, we just got so much going on, and our minds are going on like this, and, and we're active, and we're doing, and we're like this, and, and our minds are just, 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 and if they're not like this, we think something's wrong. Do you know what that is? It's withdrawal. You're so stimulated in your mind, and you're so used to it, you're like the drunk constantly and getting out wrong. They can't get out wrong. They got to have it, they drink after shave or whatever else. And God's saying, I, 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 I've told this so many times. I remember for you at one time, we were dealing with one of the grandkids that put them on some kind of drugs because they couldn't sit still in school. Do you know how to be in a a dope addict is five, because that's all the teachers used to say. He won't sit still. He won't sit still. He won't sit still. Praise God, they didn't know nothing about the drugs. Every time I put one of the children on, I know there's some that need it. Uh, I'm not bearing that, because I'm certain there's some that need But here's the deal. They were talking about putting them on, and said, he, he, he's just he's so active, he's so hyper. Well, Daddy was laying in there. We had a rental house up around High Point at the time. And she was laying in there on the couch and went to sleep. And I was watching some football game. And they had no lights on with the TV screen. And I went in there to get me a drink of water. And I had to walk around where I could not see the TV screen. Got the thing of water. And I was just going to drink about half of it and put it back in there. And so and 
I know y'all don't do that job, but it, just being her. <laughs> and I, I couldn't see the TV, but I knew the TV was on because the light was flickering against the wall in the other room that I could see. So it's around the corner. You see. And it kept flicking. I was drinking that water, and it's flicking, flicking. It's changing commercial scenes and all that. And while it was doing that right there, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's what's wrong with my children. That's the way their minds are going. They've constantly got something for them doing like that. Their minds are going like that. And their minds are getting like that. And that, 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 that's, that's what they Spirituality is developed in calm and quiet. So the faster we're moving, the harder and more difficult it is to walk spiritually with the Lord. You need quiet. The Lord went on to talk to me two things and I quit about his Sabbath, which was a, a covenant piece for Israel. For the church, it's the first day of the week. You wouldn't deserve a Sabbath. The Sabbath would be something like Friday night at 6 p.m. to Saturday night at 6 p.m. It was a, uh, a covenant uh, marker with God and the nation of Israel. But the church adapted the first day of the week. You'll find Jesus appearing to the disciples on the first day of the week. And so they, the church began to use that as a gathering time to worship. All right. But the idea of the Sabbath, though, was for these. It was for man to slow down. He needs to slow down. He, he needs to slow down. And, and so it was there so he would slow down. It would force him to slow down. I heard an absolute agnostic say this. The biggest problem. He was ag agnostic. Atheist maybe. But he, he declares agnostic. He said the biggest problem with America is she used to slow down one day a week and reflect on things. And now she doesn't slow down. She just keeps going, 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 going. Now he's an atheist, and he's recognizing what God had already put in place from the beginning that man needed to slow down. How much slowing down do you do? Do you ever intentionally just slow down? I mean, just shut down. Say, no. Intentionally, every week of my life, I have to. I have to be intentional about the time I'm going to take off. I have to make sure I do it because there's always something good to do. There's always something, you know, uh, and I'm talking about spiritual things here and other things and, and life. And, and, and so, and, and if you don't want, I mean, I got seven grandkids, three kids, they all got junk going on all the time. My goodness. So I forget what all they did this uh, past weekend. Two of them had horse shows, another them had a golf tournament, I remember all the volleyball. I don't know what I always do. Don't try to go to all that junk. <laughs> I, I love everybody. Play, 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 and play. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. I'm, I'm for you, enjoy. Just don't expect you to do I ain't coming to all that stuff. <laughs> I, I love everybody. And I love all the grandkids. But I, I can't. So, but why is this? If you're going to be a spiritual person, you're going to have to get intentional about some downtime. Right. Not necessarily is in prayer. It's just don't cut on that TV. Flick, 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 flick. Take a walk. Don't sit down on a bell of hay. Slow down. Rest. Part of this was to slow us down. Slow us down and get us to think, to reflect, to ponder about end things and life and how it ends and it's abrupt, to get people thought, focused on eternal things. I quit with this. The Lord gave me a vision during that time. I go, ooh, vision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Bible says in the last days he appointed his spirit upon all flesh. You know what I Dream dreams and old men sleep eat. You know, or a verse, all right? But the idea becomes this. He gave me a vision. And here's my vision. During this time when we were shut down, down there on my place, that no people there were working on the place, in the homeless shelter, and there's nothing but cows around there. Cows. People with cows. We don't have cows. They're in our neighboring farms, okay? And so, all they do is low in the morning, you know, 
I see them. I was able to get to Haley done. And so I was able to get out there and just, you know, enjoy time with the Lord. And one day the Lord gave me this vision. Here's how the vision goes. I, I was at the campground. And it was early in the morning. It was just about to get dawn. And dawn was just barely creeping across this steel lake. I mean, there wasn't a ripple in it anywhere. That thing was like glass, I think. Can anybody see that place right now? Can you see that? If you've ever been out there, you can't go and get up really early in the morning for any fishing, and then, what are these things? How oh, they ride? Jet skis. There's another thing they call them. What is that thing? Windbrush. Um, 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 um. <laughs> I don't know. 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 I bet they're fun. <laughs> Steel just is flat. And I'm lucky to tap. And man, uh, it was so peaceful. And the Lord whispered, said, that's your mind, man. And then he just, just quickly just replayed the last few months. I mean, going this town, that town, this place, this place. You know, in between finding where the camp would go, where the motor's going to go. We've got to need this, go here, do that, do that. I think that little sermon preach you, all that kind of stuff. He's just going on. And I'm really, he said, look at your mind. I got doing that. And I thought, wow. And all of a sudden, here comes a rock. Somebody skinned it across the water. And then another one, and another one, and another one. And another one, and finally the whole lake was there. But just jumped it up and down, up and down, up and down. And he said, Don't let your mind go back to that. Let peace be in your mind. Work at keeping peace in your mind and in your thinking. Slow yourself down. Spirituality and walking with God is not walking in the flesh. You have to learn to shut it down so you can walk in the spirit. While we're in the place. I said I'd quit with that. Let me just quit with John Wesley. It's a short one. John Wesley, just a great man of God, said that he prayed the first hour every day and the last hour every day and 10 minutes on the hour every hour. So wherever he was, 10 minutes, he would pray. Now, I'm not saying he stopped. He didn't mean he stopped, went down and knelt down and prayed. It meant that he would commune with God while he was carrying on business of the day. So in his spirit, he'd be talking to the Lord while he was carrying on with the cash register or whoever it was, you know, he was dealing with and talking to him. And he said, he so perfected that that he could carry on a, a conversation with you in the natural realm and be talking to God with, uh, in his spirit and not mess with either one. Now a preacher can tell you this. You can be standing up there preaching. And while you're preaching. And saying things. The Holy Spirit of God can be saying. Say this or say this or, or talk about that. And so while you're. you know, That's the kind of thing Wesley said. He began to perfect. To where he could carry on conversations. With God. At the same time he was talking to you. Now let me tell you something. I've seen a little bit of it. I, I've been able to do that a little bit. Let me show you what happens when that happens. Is then God gets to intervene in your stuff. When I'm talking to people and, 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 and at times, and I, and I can tell you, I, I, I listen, you know, and, and I'll even breathe to God. What do you want to say here? What's on your heart to say to this person or that person or something like that? So when you're communing with them and you're seeing people and they're with you and this one's saying that, that little old boy, come out here to change that tire with the ripping off a cuss word when he got out. We had a, what's that, that's called AAA come over here. We couldn't figure out how to work the jack. But anyhow, uh, he come over here to fix the tire this afternoon. As soon as he got out there, I said, how you doing, brother? And he cussed. He might out a big cuss word. And I said, well, Jesus, right here in front of the church, I'm talking to the Lord. And I said, Lord, would you like for me to say something like that? And he said, it's not the time. Just that quick, the Lord said, it's not the time. I went in and said, did you hear that voice? I said, yeah, the Lord, the Holy Spirit says, it's not the time. There's sometimes that you listen to me and you say, and you say, uh -huh. But you have to develop that. And that's developed in quietness, and you're going to have to learn to quiet yourself. So, 
the Lord said, I'm not looking for a ritual when you come in here is to worship me, but it's also to worship with one another. Get your mind still. Get some quietness in your life. Let that build your spirituality because as these waves come and they're coming, you're going to want to be a spiritual person as this stuff is going to be ripping this and the natural man is going to get up. But if you're prepared and ready, you're going to be one of the ones that are used in revival. I believe we're going to have a great revival. But I believe it's going to come through some time. All right, that's my question. Stand on your feet. Uh, let's see. I just want to, I'm going to focus on some I just want you to bow your head for just a minute. I'm going to say a word to uh, you and then have a word of prayer to you. If there's anybody, though, that would like to pray down here, I don't want to shut the meeting with you, but this is a dedicated place that has been set aside for Christ, and God may have something on your heart, and you want to come here, uh, certainly as I pray, you, you, you can come here and pray. If you need somebody to pray with you, get our attention. I'd be glad to play God and we would pray for you. Some of the people get around and pray. I'm going to close this in prayer, and if, if you're in here, and you just by lift a hand, I want, want me to remember you in the prayer. I won't call you by name, but if you do, lift a hand, see a hand, see two, see several, all right, I see your hand, I do see them. The best news is, is the Lord sees your hand, I see you. And, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you got to peek through this stuff. you got to come under some of us. I'm certain tiny with a little bit of me, Lord, just weave that out and move right in with all that's of you. Get it deep in our heart, bring it into our memory banks, remind us, may the Holy Spirit remind us. You said one of the things is to remind us of things to come, and so our shortest things to come and remind us of things you said. So I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would remind us of these things and then show us things to come. Begin to teach us and God, help us, oh God, to remember that these troubles and trials you're using for our good. And Lord, you're reaching for us with them. And help us to embrace you by humbly praying, seeking your face, doing what you say, resting our minds and worshiping together in spirit and truth. Bless here at Kyle Cup, Lord. Thank you for him. Bless old Blake. I love him. Victoria, bless them to lead good here the board to help help one another be unified together. Help them, oh God, to reach out into this community and touch people's lives. They've been doing it here for a uh, hundred years or so. Bless them, Lord, and continue to bless them. Lord, uh, make it even greater days than ever before here at Calcutta, I pray. Father, for each one that lifted a hand tonight, I pray you know what's behind that hand. They weren't reaching here or to me, they were reaching to you. They were saying, I trust you, Lord. So, Lord, I pray you'd help them. Whatever it is, you'd act in their behalf. Again, we thank you for the week. Thank you for the popes, their family. Bless them. Continue to bless their ministry. Continue to use them, oh God. And bless everything that they do. And I thank you for them. We love you now and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless